<clears throat> Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. Come all the way here from Lawrence, South Carolina. We come to preach the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. We come to share the hope of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world. Friends, we come here because we care for your souls. We want you to be reconciled to God. We understand Scripture tells us that man inherently is at enmity with God and needs reconciliation. And so God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come into the world and to save sinners, to save sinners from God's judgment, God's wrath against sin. And so we come to extend the offer of salvation to a lost and dying world, but also to call out sin for what it is and to warn about God's impending wrath because we care for you. If someone sees someone else walking into a burning household, they must warn the other person. That's, that's the only logically nice, compassionate, caring thing to do is to warn that person of the fact that their life is in danger. And so... When it comes to your soul, we want to warn you that your soul is in danger of being lost. And we do not want you to be lost or to be, to, to be crushed eternally under God's wrath. Instead, we want you to be made the friend of God, to become the child of God through Jesus Christ, to be adopted as a son or a daughter of the Most High through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved, as Acts 4.12 tells us. And the text of Scripture that I would like to consider this evening is Romans chapter 1, verse 32. And this is what the Apostle Paul, it's the last verse of Romans 1, and Paul writes these words. He says, And although they know the ordinance of God, but those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And the topic that I would like to consider this evening is the topic that this text covers, and that is the inherent knowledge of God's justice that man has. That men have an understanding, though it be vague, they have an understanding of God's righteousness. That God is a just judge. We know this from even just general revelation because God has given us an inherent ability to discern right from wrong. And that shows us concerning God and who He is that He discerns between what is right and what is wrong. In fact, uh, He is the definition of what is right. And anything that is in contradiction to who God is and who, what His character is like, that is sin. That is what is wrong. And mankind has an inherent knowledge concerning this aspect of God's character so that they are without excuse. So that they, on the day of judgment, though they may have never even heard about Jesus Christ, are still without excuse because they know the God of glory. They know His attributes and His character and who He has revealed Himself to be in creation apart from the Word of God. I'm here to share with you the fact that not only do those people have an inherent knowledge about God's justice and righteousness, but sinners, instead of embracing the knowledge which they have about God and seeking after God, they instead reject Him and turn from His truth and turn from the God of grace and the God of glory who has given them everything that they have and have instead rebelled and even give hearty approval. That is, that they, they support and they spur on those who do likewise and those who also turn their backs against the Most High. See, dear friends, it is a great evil to be in rebellion to your Creator because ultimately, He is not only your Creator, but your Sustainer. And He holds your destiny in His hands. And everything you have is from Him and by Him and it's sustained for Him and for His glory. And so to be in opposition to the authority of God, to be in opposition to the power of God, to be in opposition to any of these things really is, is utter foolishness. Is utter foolishness, friends. And so we, we hope that this evening God would use the, 
the glorious truth of the gospel to save many from foolishness and foolish decisions and foolish behavior and foolish life. And He would save sinners through the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Because on that cross, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, satisfied the wrath of the Father and was raised from the dead on the third day. God bless you, sir. Thank you. And it is this Gospel that I seek to proclaim to you in this sermon. But just to contemplate quickly the context here in Romans 1, Paul is explaining the sinful state of mankind. It actually begun before he even did that. In verses 16 through 17, he said these words, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So here he sets forth, this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the book unfolding and unpacking and explaining. It's his thesis statement for this grand essay, this divinely inspired book. It is the Gospel according to Paul. And so he sets forth in verse six, verses 16 and 17 what the book is about. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the euangelion, the good tidings, which save sinners from impending doom. But my friends, in order for someone to grasp and to contemplate and to understand, to even understand on a basic level the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there must first be an understanding of the bad news. And that is why in verse 18, he begins by saying, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. He continues in verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, nor give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. There's more I could read here. That's just a little snippet of what Paul is already beginning to set forth here in Romans 1. Is the bad news. Man has fallen. Man has separated himself from God by his sin. He has rejected the law of God. He has rejected the morality, the holiness, the purity of God. He has turned his back on his Creator. He rejects Him and he hates Him. He, he has set Himself up against the Most High. And so He brings upon Himself destruction and judgment. And there's a hopelessness to the bad news. There's, there's such an essence of a hopelessness when one considers the sinfulness of sin, the horror of depravity, that mankind is utterly wicked. See, people around the world consider and contemplate what is, the, what is the issue ultimately in this world? Why do we have wars and, and dysfunctional families? Betrayal, envy, strife. Is it because of economy or bad policies or evil dictators? No, it's because of the evil heart of man. Jeremiah 17.9 says, For the, the heart is deceitful above all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's, that verse is saying it, it's just so evil, it's beyond even the grandest, the deepest, the greatest comprehension. Even then, it is beyond comprehension. And so the remedy to man's fallen state is not performance or religious duty or works righteousness, but it is a gift of grace from God. It is a, a free gift of eternal life. It is the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit whereby God raises a dead sinner to spiritual life. That's the remedy. It's not a program. It's not a system. It's salvation. Saving from a hopeless state. But nonetheless, he continues on in Romans 1. And listen to what he says in verse 28. He says, And 
just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. That's a very sweeping condemnation of mankind. No one's exempt from this. Oftentimes, street preachers, well, dare I say street preachers, people who would call themselves street preachers, tend to try and anathemize or, or speak about one sin as if it's worse than the others. And there is a sense, biblically speaking, that some sins are worse than others. But in terms of the punishment for sin, all is the same. All sin earns the same punishment. But there is only one Savior for all kinds of sin, and it's Jesus Christ. All sin earns the same judgment, and it's hell. It's hellfire. And Christ is the only Savior from this terrifying end. But now we find ourselves at the end there at verse 31, now creeping into verse 32, which we will now look at, and that is that idea that I introduced at the beginning. Man's inherent knowledge of God's justice, God's righteousness. Look at what it says in verse 32. It says, And although they know the ordinance of God, in other words, they know God's decree, they know God's law, they know who God is and what He requires of them, maybe not to a full extent, as we find in Scripture, but there is a generic sense in which mankind knows right from wrong. You look around the world, you look at various cultures, you look at various societies, you look at various countries, and you will find around the world a very similar moral code that mankind generally, as a whole, agrees to things like murder. Those things are wrong. Stealing is wrong. Thievery is wrong. Uh, blaspheming God is wrong. Disobeying your parents is wrong. These things are because these things are this way because God has given man an inherent sense of right and wrong. They're able to discern. You don't have to convince somebody murder is wrong. You don't. They know it. Even little children know this. God's given people a conscience. And the word conscience is two Latin words. Con fide. With faith. With knowledge. God has given them certain knowledge of who He is and what He requires of mankind. And that's why the beginning of the verse reads, and although they know the ordinance of God, so they know it. Now, here also do we find something interesting. He says that those who practice such things are worthy of death. So he further enumerates what specifically their knowledge of God is. That not only do they know His moral standards of righteousness, but they know the punishment thereof. That they deserve punishment. They deserve judgment for their sin. Mankind even has a sense of this. That's why people experience guilt. People have, around the world, people experience guilt. In fact, I'm sure that you, at some point in your life, at one point or another, have experienced a measure of guilt for something you've done. Whether it be toward, uh, perhaps, God as you perceive, or, or someone else. I'm sure you've experienced guilt before. And that is an outworking of this reality that you know God's justice, you know who God is, and you know that He's just, and He must punish sin. Or else you wouldn't experience that emotion of guilt. But listen to what it says in the second part of the verse. We just read that it says that those who practice such things are worthy of death. And then it says, they not only do the same. In other words, they not only live in 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 rebellion to what God has said to be true, it says, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Why does mankind reject God? Why does mankind rebel against God? Is it because of a lack of evidence for God or a lack of, of um, evidence for His existence or His Word? What, what is it? It's because of their sin. I have they... I don't want to take two. Oh, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good evening. Else. Thank you. Thank you. Mankind inherently I forgot what I was saying. Got interrupted. Romans. Um, 
giving, encouraging those who do such things. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. So then not, not, not only do, 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 do sinners outside of Christ live in such a way that is in is in is in knowing knowing rebellion against God, they not only do that, but they live and they approve and they spur on those who also otherwise perhaps would not have done that, but they nonetheless do now because of their encouragement. It's an encouragement to sin more. It's an encouragement to, to walk in further rebellion against sin. And my friends, that's a bad place to be in. Not only to live in blatant rebellion to God, but also to spur others to do it. That's a dangerous spot to be in. So not only is, uh, is that guilt upon you, but even the guilt for someone else is upon you because you're leading others down to the road of destruction. In fact, uh, Jesus condemned the Pharisees in His day for that very reason. They were blind guides. They were leading people unto hell, unto eternal torment. And so Jesus gave them very strong condemnation. He called them these words in, in Matthew 23. In verse 26, He says, You blind Pharisee, first clean the outside of the cup of the di and of the dish, so that the outside of it may be clean also. Look at what he says in verse 15. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Look at what he tells them in verse 16. Woe to you blind guides. They were, they were leading other people to destruction. It was, a, it was a twisted religious system that was leading people to destruction. And the Pharisees and the scribes in Jesus' day were perpetrating that false religious system to bring other people to condemnation. They promoted a way of salvation which was by performance, which is by work, which is by deeds of righteousness, which is a way that will not save anybody. In fact, uh, many religions perpetrate themselves to be the true religion. But they all have one thing in common. It's works righteousness. The only religion that is the true religion is biblical Christianity because it is a, it is a way of salvation that is by grace. It's not by works of the law are we justified, but by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And other religious systems present salvation as a, a hard road in the sense of performance, in the sense of deeds of righteousness that one must offer up to God in exchange for salvation. The Roman Catholic Church is one such institute that perpetrates this false religion, this idol worship, rather than biblical, God-exalting, God-centered religion. It's a way of salvation which brings souls ultimately to eternal ruin. And so Jesus here in Matthew 23 condemned the scribes and the Pharisees for leading others to the way of destruction, to the way to hell because of their false religion. And so even though they knew, even though they know that Jesus, what He was saying was true, even though the scribes and the Pharisees knew what, that what Jesus was saying was true, they rejected that truth in their unrighteousness and in their sin, in their pride, that they wanted to have the, the, the glory and salvation. They wanted to receive the honor for having accomplished salvation by their own work, rather than trusting upon the grace of God as is revealed in Jesus Christ. That was the error of the scribes and the Pharisees. And it was the precise error that's spoken of here in Romans 1, 32. Those who know the ordinance of God, they not only practice that, or not only do they live in, re in rebellion to that ordinance, but they give hearty approval to those who also live in rebellion to that ordinance. The justice, the holiness of God. They have no sense of who God truly is. When someone is in this state of rebelling against God, they do not have a, a proper idea of who God is. They have, a, they, have a, they have a distorted view of who God is, of his, what His character is like, what His attributes are like, because they have a perverted view of salvation. And that's how Paul closes chapter 1 of Romans. That mankind rejects the God whom they know to be true, and they give approval. Step four. Oh, they give approval 
to those who also rebel against the God of glory. God bless you. Yeah, absolutely, brother. You just pick, you pick a good spot. Keep going. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. And so, my friends, the only way of salvation is through Christ the Lord, it's through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. And that's why in Romans 1 he says, sinful mankind is without hope outside of Christ. Sinful people are outside of Christ. They're without any hope in and of themselves. And Jesus Christ is the only way of eternal salvation. But as I was saying a moment ago, who is God? Who is God truly? Because as I said, people that are spoken of here in verse 32, they have a distorted view and a distorted image of who God is. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, who is God? Who is the God of Scripture? Well, we can't say, well, I feel like God is this way, or I sense that God is that way. We have to go off of what Scripture says. We have to go based off of what the Bible says, who God is. Who is God? Well, Deuteronomy 4 tells us that God is a consuming fire. God is a just judge. In fact, Scripture, all from, from cover to cover, describes God as a just judge. And that is a great fear to mankind. In fact, in fact, here's the thing. The Bible says God is good. That is, that God is morally perfect. He has moral perfection. And that is a great, great fear for the ungodly. Great fear for those who are outside of Christ. Because they cannot stand before His holiness. In fact, uh, in Isaiah 6, one of the texts I always love to go to, when talking about God's character, Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah, God allows Isaiah to have a vision of Himself and to see God seated on His throne in glory. In verse 1, it begins the story. Isaiah writes, in the, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings, with two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth... Did you have a question, ma'am? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was reading. Are we being videoed? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's a public place. Uh, and then, it, so they continue. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then verse 4, listen to what he says. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Did you have a question, sir? Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. You're more than welcome to. Um, so here Isaiah, one of the most holy men of his day, one of the most perfect... We could say he was really walking in blamelessness. He was a righteous man. And here God allows him to stand in His presence to see His glory. And he's terrified. Isaiah is terrified at the sight of God. Why? Because it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a scary thing, dear friends, to stand before God. It's a fearful thing because God is a holy God. He's a just judge. And the sinner cannot stand before His righteousness, before His indignation. In fact, uh, Isaiah records what these angels are saying, are crying out to one another. And they're saying, Holy! Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And that word holy means set apart, sanctified. God is set apart from all that is evil and all that is perverse and all that is wicked. And He is the definition of purity and glory and righteousness. It is true that God is gracious and compassionate, abounding in loving kindness. We see it all around us, dear friends. I don't know about you, but right now the weather is just perfect out here. It's just beautiful weather this evening. That's a testimony to God's graciousness that God would give us the privilege to live in such a world. To live day after day after day even though we fall short of His glory and we sin against Him. God is merciful. He holds back from us what we deserve. We deserve His judgment and we deserve His wrath against us and to be poured out on us. Yet God holds that back. He holds back His wrath from the wicked. One that people often say is God is love. God is love. He's a definition of what love is, as 1 John 4, 8 tells us. But that never negates His holiness. That never negates God's justice and who God is, that He is righteous. In fact, it establishes how His righteousness acts. And it's a, it's a righteousness which is loving. 
His attributes define one another, and they stand in support, not opposition to one another. You don't pick the ones you like and negate the ones you do not like. God must be taken for who He says Himself to be, whom He declares Himself to be, and not whom we feel or we think Him to be. God is very different than what many people think He is, or who many people think He is. In fact, the text of Scripture that speaks to God's attributes and beautiful harmony with one another is in Exodus chapter 34. Uh, in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, Moses is, uh, is, on, the, is on Mount Sinai and he's, he's already received the Ten Commandments from God. And God appears to him. He shows him His glory. And uh, listen to what it says in verse 6. It says, Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. So there are the attributes people have no problem accepting about God. But then look at what it says, the very next verse. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands and who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God is a holy judge, a righteous God, and His indignation burns against the wicked every day. God is holy. I really can't stress that enough because of our society that we find ourselves in and even what is often perpetrated as Christianity but is not a true Christianity. Even men who call themselves pastors are not genuine pastors and don't preach the truth of the Gospel unashamedly. And here's the truth of Scripture, that God is holy. And we've lost a sense of what that means to be holy. And God has given us His law. He's given us His commands. God has revealed His holiness and who He is in His law. He has put forth His commands for the, for the children of men to obey. See, people know the Ten Commandments. A lot of people grow up learning about the Ten Commandments, but they don't understand their purpose. What is the purpose of the Ten Commandments that God gave? Well, it's a twofold purpose. The Ten Commandments were... God bless you, God bless you sir. Thank you. It's, a, it's really a twofold purpose. It's a, it shows us two things. Firstly, it shows us the character of God, who God is. In fact, uh, I, I was just in that book, the book of Exodus. Let's go back to Exodus 20. Exodus 20 is the, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And God says in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Going down to verse 12, God says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Many of us are familiar with these. We understand what these mean. But my friends, I want you to consider this. God put those there for a purpose. And it's to show us who He is. It's to show us who He is. And He is perfect. He's perfect. Why does God say not to murder? Why does God say we shall not murder someone else? It's because He's not a murderer. He's not a murderous God. Why does God say you shall not lie? Because God is truth. He cannot lie. He is absolutely, perfectly truthful in everything He says. And so for us to lie is to act in contradiction to God's character. Why does God say you shall not steal? God's not a thief. That's why. It shows us God's character, who He is. You shall not commit adultery. God is a perfect covenant-keeping God. He never fails to keep His promises. See, my friends, these show us who God is. It's, the law of God is like a mirror. It shows us something about God. It's His glory. It's His glory. The law is a revelation of God's glory. God is so glorious. It's, it's His weighty. There's something weighty about His character. And that, that's the essence of God's beauty, who He is, that makes Him the way He is, makes Him distinct and sets Him apart from us, is His holiness and is His righteousness. Truly, He is above us, separate from us, and not like us. And the law of God not only shows us 
who God is, but secondly, it shows us something else, who we are in light of who God is, who we are in the eyes of God. Because those same commands, we find something wrong. Not with the commands, but with us. We see a very terrifying issue. We can't keep them. Look at the law, dear friends. Consider God's holiness. Consider the fact He said you shall not lie. Have you ever lied in your entire life? Dear friend, have you lied? Well, then God sees you as a convicted liar. Someone who has not told the truth. Who has borne false witness. I've lied in my life before. Ask, ask yourself, have I ever stolen? Have I ever taken something that was someone else's for my own possession? Well, then you have transgressed. You have trampled God's law under your feet. You have taken God's law, which is a, a display of His character, and you've trampled His character under your feet. You've disregarded who He is. Another command, God says you shall honor your father and mother. Well, this is one that we're all very guilty of. I'm sure you can think about years in your life when you were younger and you rebelled against your parents. That's dishonoring. And that ultimately dishonors God's authority. You, another command is God says you shall not commit adultery. You shall not... That is, you, you, you should not basically cheat on your spouse. And people say... And many people have not actually done this. Have cheated on their spouse. But Jesus comes along in Matthew 5 and says that if you look at a woman with lust for her, God considers you as having committed adultery in your heart. And this goes for you women as well. If you look at a man with lust, God sees you as having committed adultery in the heart as well. See, friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. He sees the intent of the heart. He knows who you are inwardly, not who you project yourself to be to everyone else. God sees when all the doors are closed and all the lights are off and you're out of the spotlight and you're alone. God sees that. God sees the inward man. In fact, now listen to what God... This is what God sees. He doesn't see someone with good intentions. He doesn't see someone with a pure heart or pure motives. How do we know that? Genesis 6-5 reads, Then the Lord looked down and saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God does not see inherent goodness in you and He doesn't see it in me. He doesn't. It's not there. It's not there at all. We have nothing to give to God. God sees us as what we are, as liars and thieves, as adulterers, even as murderers. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if you have anger in your heart toward your brother for an unjustified reason, you've committed murder. You're guilty as if you committed murder, dear friends. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. See, friends, we have, to un we have to come to grips with the holiness, the justice, and the righteousness of God. We must grab hold of that and contemplate that. Listen to what Romans 3 says concerning sinful mankind. Verse 10, There is none righteous, there is not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is no one who does good, there is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Man outside of Christ is dead in sin. Those who have fallen short of the glory of God, all of us by default, even me, outside of the grace of God, I'm a dead sinner. I'm a lost wretch. And so are you. We are outside of Christ by default. People are not born inherent, inherently good. No inherent goodness. Listen to what Ephesians 2.1, Paul writing to the believers at Ephesus. These are people who had already been saved. He says in verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's the state of those who are outside of Christ. And because of our breaking of God's law, as we are considering that text out of Romans 1 and verse 32, it says that those who practice such things are worthy of death. What does Paul mean here when he says in verse 32 that those who practice such things are worthy of death? Is he talking about a, a, a physical death? 
Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. That is an effect of the fall, but what is he referencing? He's referencing the eternal death that hell is. Hell is a real place, dear friends. In fact, Jesus Christ, the chief figure in all Scripture, talked about hell more than he did about heaven. He covered the subject more than he did about heaven. Just do a cursory reading of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you'll find that to be true. In fact, uh, Jesus is the, the foremost authority in all the Bible on the teaching about hell. No one else in all the Bible talked about hell more than Jesus did. In fact, we know almost everything we do about hell because of what Jesus said or what Jesus mentioned in His teaching. And it was not good. It was a scary thing. Those who are outside of Christ, having broken God's law, having broken it and transgressed it and rebelled against it, deserve the punishment. Dear friends, if someone murders someone else here in, in Greenville County, if a man murders and rapes a woman, or rapes and murders a woman, I should say, he deserves to be killed for his crime or thrown into prison. That's justice. And no one would contend with that. Everybody screams out, yes, justice, punish the evildoer. And it is so much more with God. God is perfect in His justice. He's the judge of all the earth, as the book of Genesis tells us. And He will judge both the living and the dead. He will judge the wicked. And so we all, by default, stand before God having broken His law, just as a, a, a rapist and a murderer stands before the, the, the broken law here in the United States of America. And we deserve the punishment. We deserve it. We have no defense that we could possibly give. Well, so what is the punishment, we ask? What is the, the, the chosen punishment for the breaking of the law of God? What is God set aside as the punishment for the transgressing of His law? It is hell. Hell is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, the place of outer darkness. It is a place of an eternal flame which will never be quenched. It is a place for God's enemies to reside eternally where they're crushed, where they're lost, they're separated from the grace of God and the goodness of God as they are punished for their sin. Listen to what Jesus said about hell in, in Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Jesus said, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better for you to, to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better for you to enter life lame than you having two feet to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out, for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There's an unquenchable fire flame. That's the horror of hell, my friends. Let, let the moans of the eternally damned uh, bring you to fear the Lord. God is a holy God, and He doesn't look over sin. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't compromise His character, but He must administer justice. A judge here in, in Greenville County must administer judgment upon the pedophile, upon the rapist, upon the murderer. He must. He must. No one would contend if a, if a murderer was put away for 25 years to life. No one would contend with that. And yet people are angry when they consider God's justice and the fact that God punishes the wicked. But the Bible tells us God is angry with the wicked every day. Every moment God's anger burns against those who reject Him and who, who scorn Him and who rebel against His authority. So God's justice, God, God's punishment for sin is hell. And friends, we come out here out of love for you and a love for your souls, and we don't want you to go there. We don't want you to die in your sins and, and to be lost in hell. Hell is horrible for two main reasons. Firstly, because of its eternality. It never ends. It's a, it's a continually present punishment. And then secondly, we don't want you to go to hell because it is a place of separation from the goodness and grace of God. And that's not even to speak about all of the torments of it and the horrible aspects of hell. That's not even to speak to the other things even that Jesus spoke about in, this, in these verses I just read. That it is an unquenchable flame. You can't, no matter how much water you pour onto it, no matter what you do, it will not be quenched. It just continues to burn just continues to burn. And that's why Paul could say in Romans 1, in verse 18, for the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Dear friends, I do not want you to go to this place of torment. And that's why I'm warning you about it. I'm warning you. Escape the wrath of God which is to come. Escape the judgment that's going to befall the ungodly. Escape it before it is too late, dear friend. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't lose your soul for your sexual immorality. But flee to Christ who is the way and the truth and the life. So in this state of, of, of helplessness, really, we find ourselves condemned and having broken God's law. My friends, there is another aspect which I have yet to cover. And that is the fact that no good deeds will, will amend you with God. No good deeds can make you right with your Creator. Regardless of what the Pope tells you, the man of perdition, the Antichrist, the man who is, in a, who is in rebellion to the authority of Jesus Christ, no matter what the Pope at Rome tells you, salvation is not by your works. And someone who is a good atheist, it does not matter how good you are. You're not going to enter heaven by your work. It's by grace. Doesn't matter what the Jehovah's Witnesses tell you. Salvation is by grace. Doesn't matter what the Mormons tell you. Salvation is by grace. Whatever cult tells you, it doesn't matter. It's what the Word of God says. It's by grace. And you cannot possibly earn a right standing before God. Think about how foolish it would be for a convicted murderer here in Greenville to tell a judge, Judge, listen, I stopped murdering people. I've been giving to charity ever since that happened, that terrible day. I have been doing community work. I'm a good person. Just let me go, judge. And the judge is going to say, listen, you're not being judged for what you've done good, but what you've done bad. And in the same way with God, it doesn't matter how much good you've done. It doesn't matter if you have mountains of righteousness, mountains of good deeds. Your goodness is not good enough. It will never erase the bad. It is just simply a layer uh, upon layer upon layer of supposed good deeds. But deep down under that, God sees through it and His eyes cut through it like a sharp blade through butter. And He sees the core of your being and He sees that you're stained with sin. Many of you are dressed nicely this evening, but your soul is tainted by sin. And you seem not worried about this. Dear friends, we're worried for you. We're worried for your souls. No one can earn a right standing before God by religious performance. In fact, uh, in fact uh, um, Isaiah 64 verse 6 in the Old Testament says that our good deeds are like filthy rags before God. Because it's an affront to God. It's an offensive thing. Again, going back to the analogy I just gave a few minutes ago, if a murderer here in Greenville tells that to a judge, argues for his own goodness before the judge, the judge would be offended that the murderer would try and argue for his own goodness. It's an affront to God. It's an offense to God. It's a stench in his nostrils to try and earn a righteousness before God because it's not enough. So truly, we are without hope. We're without any hope. But now, my friends, I can reveal to your eyes the glory of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The beauty of the good news. That Gospel that Paul began, Romans 1, in verse 16, by stating he was going to unfold and unpack the rest of the book of Romans. It is the beauty of the Christian faith. It is the heart of the Christian faith. The central cardinal point of our doctrine is the glorious Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the good news that God, being rich in mercy, God is rich in mercy and rich in abounding love for His people that He sends His Son, God Almighty, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. The eternal God, the eternal Word becomes flesh and dwells among sinful men. What does every other religion in the world tell you? Work your way up to God. Build your way up to God. But biblical Christianity says what? God worked His way down to man. He condescended. He condescended and humbled Himself and dwelt among men. A text of Scripture that beautifully speaks to this is in Philippians 2. Where Paul tells the Philippians in verse 5, he says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of sinful men, being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient 
to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the glory of the Gospel. God comes and saves the creation. Crea Creator comes and dies for the creation. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law. He was born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. And He came and lived a perfect life of obedience to the law of God. He never transgressed one of God's commandments, but kept it in His perfect life. In fact, Jesus Himself said in Matthew 3, or excuse me, Matthew 5, verse 17, He said these words, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Christ came to fulfill it. So when we see the commands like, You shall not lie. Christ never lied. You shall not dishonor your parents. Christ never dishonored His parents. The command that says, You shall not commit adultery. He never committed adultery. And on and on and on, Jesus fulfilled the law of God. That's why the Father could declare from heaven in an audible voice in Matthew 3, in verse 17. He could declare these very words over Jesus at the beginning of His ministry. This is My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He pleased the Father. He did something that none of us can do, and that is please God. He pleased the Father, the Eternal Son. Pleased the Father's justice. And then He went to the cross. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, the divine God-man, went to the cross and satisfied the wrath of God against sin. He was beat. He, he underwent a horrible death. He was beat by Roman soldiers, spat upon. He was betrayed by His disciples even. Or I should say, abandoned by His disciples and betrayed by one of them into the hands of sinful men. He was given a crown of thorns and He was nailed to a cross. And on that cross, something glorious happened. On that cross, Jesus Christ died for the sins of God's people. He died for the sins of God's people. The sins of the church. That's the beauty of God's love for His people. As um, Ephesians 5.25, Paul says to the uh, men in Ephesus, he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, that He might sanctify her, having washed her with the water of the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she'd be holy and blameless. That's the beauty. Christ, the greatest love story is Christ in the church. That's the greatest love story. Hollywood always is trying to produce a romantic movie or novel writers trying to produ uh, produce the most amazing, most epic novel, romance novel, the greatest romances. Yes, sir, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, could you read Galatians 2.20? Galatians 2. I actually have it memorized. I can recite it for you if you'd like. Let me just finish my thought real quick. Okay. So Jesus died for His brother. That's the greatest love story. Absolute greatest love story is the love that Jesus has for His church. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Guys, if you stick around just about five minutes, this is probably I'm going to sing that verse, and He's going to preach on it. Mm, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. God bless you. Um, if you would, we'd love, my friends would love to talk with you. I'm going to continue to preach, but they'd love to speak with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you have a good after, or a good evening, I should say. So, dear friends, that's the, that's the the greatest story ever told. Jesus Christ, Jesus in the church. His love for the church, His love for His bride, His love for His people. And so, he, he stretched upon the cross, as I said. And on that cross, something glorious happened. Something glorious happened. Uh, and, and in Mark 15, we get a sense of what was happening at the cross in verse 34. It says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the cross... God the Father forsook His Son. That is that God unleashed upon Christ the full fury of His wrath against sin. What is hell? What, what is hell? It is God unleashing His wrath against sin. It is God unleashing His judgment against the wicked.
wicked. And so what is the cross of Jesus Christ? Instead of God pouring out His wrath on sinners in hell, God pours it out on His Son. God unleashes it on His Son. Isaiah 53.10 says, But it pleased Yahweh to crush Him. Christ took ownership of our sin. Christ took responsibility for the sins which I have committed and which I'm going to commit even. He took responsibility for the sins of His bride, of His people. See, the Bible says in eternity past, God set aside a people unto Himself to save. It's the elect. God chose a select few to bring to eternal salvation. And so He agreed with the Son, Jesus Christ, in eternity past to, to, to send Christ into the world, to die for this select people. And then even the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, agreed to enable Christ to do what He did and then to regenerate those who Christ died for. Amen. And so, God bless you, sir. Thank you. And so, this beautiful Trinitarian work where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit agreed to, to come into the world and to save sinners, to invade history, and to bring a certain people to salvation. That's the glory of the Gospel. So Christ comes in. Jesus comes in at a, a set time in history, as Galatians 4, 4 tells us, which is within the fullness of the times. In the fullness of the times, God sent forth His Son. And Jesus on that cross bore the eternal wrath of God. The weight of it is so great, it, none of us can hold up. But Christ, Christ, the strong Savior, the manliest man, the Lord of glory, the King of the ages, the Rock of ages, stands under the wrath of God and is ground to dust, is crushed. He was abandoned by the Father at the cross. And He cried out that cross, as the book of John records, to Telestai, one word in Aramaic, but it's translated to three English words. It is finished. He said it was done, that the wrath of God was satisfied. It was propitiated. Romans 3 tells us that Christ was a propitiation. 1 John 2 tells us Jesus Christ is our propitiation. He satisfies eternal wrath against sin. And three days later, what happened? The Father rose Him up from the grave. He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures as the Lord of glory, as the victorious King. He was raised and He will never die again. The book of Hebrews tells us He has died once, never to die again. Never will death have any reign over Him. He submitted Himself for that set period, but death could not hold Him. He is the way and the truth and the life. As um, John 11, 25 tells us, He is the resurrection and the life. And so He was raised from the grave on the third day according to what the Scriptures say. That's the heart of the Gospel message, that Jesus Christ died and was buried and was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Paul writes in Titus 3, he says in verse 3, For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. It's the grace of God. It's a revelation of God's grace. And so 40 days later, as Jesus ministered, He ministered for 40 more days after being raised from the grave. Appeared to His disciples. Appeared to more than 500 people at one time. And then He was received into glory. He ascended into heaven bodily. And He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sat down at the right hand of the Father's throne where He reigns and where He rules over the universe. And He sat there as the King of glory. As the, the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. See, in the temple, high priests never were to sit down. Never. But they were to always stand up. They were to always, always stand up. There was never anywhere to sit down in the temple. And so Christ comes in and sits down. God bless you, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. Thanks, man. You're awesome. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. 
But Christ, the high priest forever, comes in and He sits down at the right hand of God's throne. He sits down at the Father's right hand. And that was, that was, in, that was incredible. It was something no high priest ever did in their priestly work. But Christ did it to show us there is no work to be added on to what He has done. And so the proper reaction of the Gospel is repentance and faith. Uh, in faith. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. What does it mean to repent? Repentance means to change your mind. To flee your sin. To turn away from your pornography. To turn away from your drunkenness and your selfishness. To turn, turn away from your self-trust. Trusting in yourself to save you. And turning to God. It's a 180. You've got to turn from sin and turn to God. And secondly is to believe. To believe the message of the Gospel. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, Repent and believe. God bless you guys. If you have a question, I'd love to answer if you have any questions. Does Jesus still love me if I have addictions? Um, abs uh, well, what do you mean by... What do you mean by love? In what sense? Is he cool with me having problems with drugs? Uh, well, the Bible says that God's wrath is against those who are in sin, but... Is that a camera? Yeah, yeah, it's a GoPro. Oh, we're in a public place. Never mind. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, you're okay. What, what was the question? I, maybe I can answer it over here. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I really apologize. Yeah, okay. I got this, this guy's great. He'll answer. <laughs> and the second thing is to believe the message of the gospel, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and to be saved from your sin. To believe, simply take God at His word, grab hold of the of the promise of the gospel message. See, the gospel is a promise from God to save sinners from their sin if they believe upon His Son. So whether you're young or whether you're old. The, the call of the Gospel is repent and believe. Turn from your sin. Turn from self-trust. Turn from self-reliance and turn to the Son of God. And have your confidence in Him. If you were in a plane, and the plane was going down, and a flight attendant threw you a, a parachute and said, put this on, and we're going to jump in 30 seconds. And you're 35,000 feet up. You're going to grab that parachute and you're going to put it on. And friends, I'm here to warn you, the plane is crashing. The plane's going to crash in just a few moments. Your life's going to be taken from you one day. You're going to die. You're going to stand before God. But the parachute, Jesus Christ, salvation is there for you. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sins. Trust in Him alone and He'll save you from your sins. In Matthew 1, the angel promises Joseph... He says, and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sin. That's the, that's the promise of the Gospel. Jesus Christ saves sinners from their sin. So believe it. Believe it with all your heart. And you'll be saved. The sinner who believes upon Christ will be forgiven of all their sin because of Christ's atoning work at the cross. And they will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. They will be treated as if they lived Jesus' life. They'll be counted righteous in Him. God will look at them as if they lived Jesus' life because God looked at Christ as if He lived theirs. That's the exchange of the Gospel. Christ takes my sin and I get His righteousness. Christ takes my filth and I get His perfection. I get His deeds of righteousness imputed to me. Dear friends, this is the beauty and the glory of the Gospel. Turn from your sin and believe upon Christ alone. And God will forgive you of your sin and give you eternal life. He'll wrap you in the righteousness of Christ. In fact, Paul said these words in Philippians 3, verse 8. He says, uh, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. You need a righteousness that's not your own. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So dear friends, receive the gift of foreign righteousness. Receive the gift of Christ's righteousness today. 
And this, is, this gospel is not only for the unconverted, but even for the saints. This gospel incites zeal and brings God's people great joy. So it is to be the focus of the life of every believer that they distribute and publish it and live upon it day in and day out. For it is our daily bread, the good news of Christ. This gospel is to the glory of God. It is for the glory of God. As Romans chapter 11 says, Paul writes, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. It's all to the glory of God. That's what it's all for. So give God the glory, friends. My friends, turn to Jesus Christ and live today. Turn from your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll be saved. As I mentioned, you'll be forgiven of your sin and given the righteousness of Christ. You must deny yourself and take up your cross daily and come after Jesus Christ. Jesus said, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Following Christ is hard. The way of life is hard because you must deny yourself. You must be set off, uh, cut off from your friends even because they're going to shun you if you follow after Christ. You're going to be the loser in your group. You, no one's going to talk to you because you're following after Christ. But that's what it costs. Jesus himself said that whoever is ashamed of him and his words... Christ is going to be ashamed of, of them when He comes in judgment. When He comes on the day of judgment. And so, dear friends, you must be set apart as holy unto God. You must repent and look to Christ for eternal life. You must flee to Him, for He is the only way of salvation. And dear brethren, dear Christians, if you're out here, if God has His saints out here to hear the message of the Gospel, I encourage you to live and feed upon the Gospel day in and day out. And to live in obedience to the truth of God's Word. And to publish and redistribute the Gospel everywhere you go. And to feed upon it daily, for it is our daily bread. So in conclusion, we have seen here in Romans 1, verse 32, that mankind outside of Christ knows God's ordinance, knows God's holiness and justice, knows what they deserve for their sin, yet they practice that which earns them God's judgment, and they approve of those who practice that which earns God's judgment. Truly man is lost outside of Christ, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in the Savior. For the Bible says He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. He lives to make intercession. Dear friends, flee to Christ. Flee to Him today. He is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And it is to the Lord Jesus Christ I say, and I bring glory. I bring Him all the glory. To Jesus Christ, the eternal God, be glory, honor, praise and worship forever, forever, from eternity to eternity. In the church, in the world, in all of your lives, in everything, forever. Amen. Amen.